Thank you, Sasha, uh, for this wonderful opportunity. So I'm having immense pleasure to moderate this session, and I'm thankful to my professors, Sasha Kovacs and Alana Lindgren, for making me the symposium coordinator as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, this session, we will be talking about the. Uh, it, it, it would lead to a discussion about that provides in, insight into the on the ground approaches to the uh, preservation of performance culture. So, um, to my extreme left, I'm having Matthew. Matthew Payne is a playwright, performer, and arts administrator based in Victoria. A graduate of the University of Victoria's theatre program, Payne has been produ uh, producing theatre, performance, events and public programs to audiences of all ages for 20 plus years, working with a variety of partners and stakeholders. Thank you, Matthew, for being among us. Thank you so much. Uh, to your right, to, we are having Carolyn Clare. Carolyn is a doctoral student at Simon Fraser University's Department of English and her research focuses on the protocols for Native American archival materials in relation to Vancouver-based performing arts records. She has collaborated with dance organizations in Vancouver to survey their in information management needs and update their practices. She holds a Master in Museum Studies from the University of Toronto and received training at Dance Collection Dance, Jacobs Pillows Dance Festival Archive, and Stratford Festival Archive. Her research is funded by a Vanier CJ scholarship as well. Welcome, Carolyn, to this symposium. So, to her right, we are having beautiful Amy Barbara Bowery. <laughs> Amy, uh, is the executive and curatorial director at Dance Collection Dance, where she was mentored by founders Lawrence and Miriam Adams, and she has been involved with the organization since 1993. She is one of Canada's foremost advocates for the study and preservation of Canadian dance heritage. Amy has published numerous articles on dance history and has curated several live and virtual dance uh, virtual exhibitions. She has lectured across Canada and teaches dance history at Ryerson University. She has contributed to various boards and committees in the arts and museum sectors. Amy is the editor of Down to Bowering, a memoir, a memoir written by her grandfather, Teddy Bowering. Her book, Navigating Home, Artists of the Annual Dance Project, was, uh, was published in 2019. Welcome, Amy. And to my left, we are having gorgeous <laughs> Janice, <laughs> Janice Lapu. She is a writer with a love of wild green spaces. As an arts advocate, she chronicled the arts and performance, mainly theater in Victoria, British Columbia. And on her website, JaniceLapu.com from 2009 to 2018. Her monthly column, Art Smarts, uh, appeared in Monday Magazine from 2013 to 2018. Now retired, she devotes time to community building, ecological uh, restoration, and exploring the wonders of Vancouver Island from our home in Campbell River. So, welcome all of you. Now, like uh, we know, like uh, it's a discussion on like, on the ground approaches of preservation of culture. So, um, there's a prompt question which is already there, like which is in all of our minds. It's about what are the challenges in your own work of maintaining the records of performance history? If you could cite one of the examples from your own work. So I'll start the discussion with Amy Bowery. So. Uh oh, Kathy, yes. you might need your finger. <laughs> <laughs> just your finger. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, as I don't know how many people here are familiar with Dance Collection Dolls, but it's basically the largest uh, collection of dance archival materials and artifacts in, in Canada. Its focus has been on theatrical dance history. Last year, we removed the word theatrical from the collection's policy. 
which now broadens the scope of what we collect. So when uh, Priyanka sent that prompt question, what are the challenges of your work? My first thought was, well, okay, well, how long have you got? <laughs> because there are many. But uh, so I'll give you the highlights of, of the challenges. So uh, the first thing, of course, is the ephemeral nature of the discipline itself. The main artifact of what we collect is intangible. It happens on a stage in a moment, and it's gone again. So we have, to we have to collect all the things around it. So this slide here just shows you an example. We've got choreographic notes, house programs, souvenir programs, films, makeup, costume materials, moving image records, uh, photographs, um, uh, newspapers, media coverage, musical scores, um, correspondence, um, teaching notes, slides, all of those kinds of things. And so our, our um, goal is to collect both the artifacts, such as props and costumes and sets and so on, as well as the flat stuff, the documents, the photographs, the clippings, that kinds of thing, those kinds of things. Um, and of course, there are never enough financial resources to do the work. There's never enough to pay the humans that we need to rehouse, arrange, catalog all the materials. Uh, we never have adequate storage space. We, at this point in our history, we don't have stable um, operational facilities. We, we're a founder-led organization until last April. And we operated out of the founder's home, Lawrence and Miriam Adams, who were two ex-national ballet dancers who had started Canada's first venue for experimental dance in the 1970s. They were a part of the major dance boom of the 70s. And they got into archiving. They spent the 70s and 80s with a porta pack going around recording dance that was happening around the country. And so when they did this major reconstruction project and stuff started coming out of attics and basements, um, they initiated dance collection dolls to hang on to it. So about uh, six years ago, we moved out of the house into our own space where we had some storage, some exhibitions, and then of course off-site storage. Um, we became a victim of the Toronto real estate market when the building we were in was slated for demolition, for condo development. So we're now for the same amount of money we were paying, we're in a space that is uh, less than half of what we had. So we lost our exhibition space. And so we've changed the programming to more virtual activity, more traveling activity, that kind of thing. There are magical ways of doing the work, and we just do what we can to do them. Um, so we are, we're working on some, some things that will you know, make change happen over the years. But that, that's the challenge right now. Um, digitization is another major challenge. We have over 3,400 moving image records from 8 millimeter film to every kind of magnetic tape that you can imagine. And uh, in the 70s, dancers were using the cheapest half inch magnetic tape they could find. It was called silver chrome. And I've been told uh, uh, our main, the, the organization we primarily use for transfer is uh, B-Tape. Uh, Kim Tomczak told me that the main substance he takes off of our tapes is nicotine. Because oh. everybody smoked in the studios, and everybody smoked in the editing suites, and all over the tapes. So he uses our tapes as a teaching tool. Uh, but that's a big, big problem for us, is, is digitizing those records, which we do in little pockets when we get a bit of cash, or a researcher is willing to pay for the digitization, and we benefit from that, that kind of thing. Um, I estimated uh, a couple of, a few years ago for a grant application that we, it probably cost us about $550 to take one banker's box of material. So that includes, that's not the long-term storage, that's primarily the human time to, to rehouse, re, to arrange and catalog all of it. Um, but I have taken some solace in getting to know the Ontario Museum community because it's clear that we are not alone in how we look after things, in what our situation is, what our challenges are. And uh, after listening to Jerry this morning, he was like, yeah, best practices are what you aim for, but you hardly ever achieve. But you know what? The work is not in a dumpster. 
and I take solace in that. It, it's being protected in the best way that we can possibly manage, and I know what the alternative is, having rescued many, many things from basements, attics, garages, dumpsters, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, the other thing that's a challenge is, is burnout, and this is an issue that's coming up in, you know, a lot in the performing arts world. Um, my, uh, my father-in-law happened to be a theater director, and, and he once said to me that the problem with creative work and work that you love is that it energizes you, and so you don't realize that it's burning you out mm -hmm. as you just keep going because you love the work, and it's, oh, it's great, it's exciting, and before you realize it, you're completely fried. Um, so that, that is, a, is a perpetual problem, and um, of course, one of the solutions is more money so that you can pay more people and share the workload. So another challenge. Uh, we're also, as I mentioned, transitioning from a founder-led organization to an institution that will outlive its founders. Um, and so that transition has its own challenges. Um, and one of which I frequently find myself rebelling against is all that formality. Like yesterday, you know, Yuri was showing some of the things he has to sign when he goes into other archives, um, which we've never made people sign in our collection. But, but it's that, so I sometimes rail against that formality. We've always been a gritty arts organization. Uh, and so I, I want to keep things accessible. That's what's really important to me is that collect it and share it and celebrate it and make it available to people. So that, that's, you know, as you make that transition, and I think about, you know, 25 years from now, when I'm not there, what's, you know, what will the changes be? But I didn't want to, um, you know, Priyanka said the challenges. I didn't want to be a big complaining pants, so I thought <laughs> I would finish by mentioning a few opportunities so that we end on a high note. Here. <laughs> so one is that we're, one thing to celebrate is that we're still here after nearly 35 years. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> it was just one picture for decoration. Uh, so we're still here, we can still continue to have an impact, we can still keep fighting the good fight. Uh, we're working on partnerships that will help reduce some of those burdens that I mentioned, that will help build stability for the organization, both financially and in terms <laughs> I've done apparently. <laughs> Two steps. Uh, and, and that will help build stability. One of the big things that we're working on, we've got three grants out there, cross your fingers, everyone, I should hear in the next few weeks, mm -hmm. to build something huge called the Digital Collection of Canadian Dance that aims to link the pockets of dance history that live in archives and special collections across the country that are quite often hidden because the mandate of those archives is municipal or provincial government or something like that. But there are, we, we did a study and we found that there are pockets of dance history from Prince Rupert to St. John's and we want to build a portal where people can contribute some of that material and, and increase its accessibility. Um, and then another huge opportunity, of course, is broadening the collection itself by taking theatrical out of the policy we can take work that is social, that is spiritual, that is theatrical in its purpose. So that really broadens the scope. And then one of the exciting things that, that or one of the things that I'm very excited about is, is responding to the recommendations made to museums in the Truth and, and Reconciliation uh, report. And uh, we have, to that effect, initiated an Indigenous Knowledge Circle that we are uh, planning to gather this summer um, to start talking about how we do this. Right now, the only, uh, the only collection of Indigenous nature in the collection is Santi Smith's Kahawi Dance Theatre Material, which, of course, is theatrical in nature. Um, but we are looking forward to learn, working with the uh, Indigenous communities across Canada on what, like, how we can help, how we can share knowledge. If people want to deposit, how do we do that? What are the things that we need to know? Thank you, Amy. So may I have the opportunity to frame the reframe the question? So like what are the prospects and consequences or consequences and prospects of your own work? So um, now we'll be listening to Carolyn Clear. Sorry, just gonna try. 
at SFU, um, mostly because Amy told me to. <laughs> um, and that was just at the same time that SFU's Special Collections and Rare Books was acquiring a new collection of uh, Judith Marcuse's archival materials. So Judith Marcuse, you can't hear me. Okay. Uh, is that a little bit better? Sure. Um, Judith Marcuse is a Vancouver-based an internationally acclaimed performer, choreographer, producer, and educator. Her collection included hundreds of digital moving image recordings, a few dozen posters, 30 and 35 boxes of paper records. And I was hired by Special Collections to begin the process of organizing Marcuse's material. And although I was new to Vancouver and to Marcuse's work, I was amazed to find how familiar her work was. The lines and energies of Marcuse's and her dancers were clearly legible to me. The humor embedded her in her work felt like old family jokes, and I was easily moved by her musical selections. And at least twice, I was surprised by my finding. First, I was delighted to see that Marcuse had danced, had danced alongside Sasha Belinsky, a former dancer of the Combat Academy. And in watching Belinsky partner Marcuse, I recalled dancing with Belinsky, who was my uncle Drosselmeyer in a Montreal-based version of the Nutcracker. Dancing with Belinsky was my favorite part of the Nutcracker. I loved the work of anticipating his movements and the momentum of the spins that he lifted me into. Because I was new to Vancouver and to the Marcuse collection, I had not anticipated that her archive would revive embodied memories of my favorite people and places from my hometown. A second surprise occurred when one of the videos I was working with loaded more quickly than I had expected, and I jumped upon, in mild fright upon hearing the sound of a friend's voice who now lived uh, uh, hundreds of kilometers away. Um, although I had known that Dr. Seika Boy had danced in Vancouver, I hadn't realized that she had performed with Marquise. The shock I had felt at hearing Seika's voice was followed by my own laughter over my unnecessary fright and the delight of having a digitized friend appear in my new <laughs> I then took a picture of Seika's digitized self, which I emailed to her, along with an explanation that, without her current and ongoing consent, and for better or worse, Seika was about to be immortalized in, work in an archive. <laughs> Here again, despite me being new to Marquise's work, um, Marquise's records felt familiar and friendly. So my, my unexpected familiarity with Marcuse's records was unsettled when I viewed a recording named the Coquitlam Coquitlam Native Performance and Resource Network promotional video. Beyond the name of the video, which was listed in an Excel sheet that Judith Marcuse had provided, I had no other information about this recording. I, I watched the recording with interest, but the footage did not bring me to relive moments of movement that I had once rehearsed nor remind me of people I had once danced alongside. I viewed, in viewing this video, I questioned whether any restrictions should be placed on it. Did the Canadian Native Dance Theater know that this recording had just been acquired by SFU? Does the Canadian Nation have specific cultural protocols that should or could be respected by SFU's digital platform? If restrictions should be placed on the video, would SFU be willing to accommodate those uh, protocols? So moreover, I use the theory to question both my, my sense of familiarity and discomfort in response to those different dance videos. Um, and that discomfort propelled me to learn more and to seek out answers to my questions, which has become my dissertation. So the dissertation in a nutshell, um, I'm gonna share three points today. So first, my questions led me to seek out further training, which I did at UBC's iSchool, and in part uh, under the mentorship of Jerry's sister, Kim Lawson. Um, where I was introduced to the Protocols for Native American Archival Materials, which is a set of guidelines, as many of you may know, on how settler collecting institutions can follow the lead of in Indigenous information communities to support Indigenous sovereignty over cultural heritage. 
Second, um, my questions led me to look at the work and archive of Karen Jameson. Jameson is a Vancouver-based choreographer for over three decades, has developed dance work with settler and indigenous dancers, and importantly to this audience, some of that work was developed at the Museum of Anthropology under the guidance of former director um, Michael Ames, as well as Doreen Jensen and Chief Ken Kenneth Harris. Um, and Jameson's archivist is here today. Hello, Claire. <laughs> Um, and I look to Jameson's choreographic process as a model for performing respectful archival acts. And then the third, I'd like to share with you a survey um, that I have here today and I can distribute if you want. Um, and it's a survey that I developed with special collections at SFE to get a sense for the needs of um, information needs of dance organizations in Vancouver. And the results of the survey suggest that there's a space for collaboration between performing arts organizations as well as collecting institutions and universities. For example, we found that dance organizations struggle not only with managing their historical records, but also their active records, so, so managing their information in general. Um, I believe that dance organizations, and probably a lot of other nonprofits, need access to a robust information management system that can help them manage their mostly digital records. And it is possible that collecting institutions or universities could help provide access to those systems. Uh, similarly, the survey implied the need to identify dance materials within dance organizations, as well as museums and archives. If you don't know what's out there, it's hard or nearly impossible to develop the type of respectful relationships that the protocols recommend. Um, so in short, some of us have chatted about the, this idea of adapting the survey uh, in order to um, survey the needs and contents of other collecting institutions, as well as performing arts organizations in other regions of Canada. So I welcome your feedback on this idea. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Barry. Now it's time for Janice. I think I'm the only non-academic in the room. And I'll answer the question, first of all, um, of what, how I came as the only non-academic in the room to do the work that I did. Um, most of you remember the economic climate of 2008, uh, 2008 and what it did to the funding for arts organizations. Um, we all suffered. You all suffered. And at that time online, if articles were being posted with open comments, the comments from the general public were basically that artists are lazy and don't deserve the funding. I have a son who's a performing artist. Um, I grew up as an adult seeing people like Matthew Payne and Theater Scam perform, but until he left um, the house, I didn't have time. Or money. So two young men left the house. I had time and money. I started to volunteer in the theater community. Um, he graduated. I had access to performers and young performers um, who were doing groundbreaking work at the time. Atomic Vaudeville had just formed. The Canadian College of Performing Arts was about 10 years old at that period. And there were a lot of graduates of the University of Victoria Theater School who were cast into this malstorm, if you will, where they had to go out and start creating their own work. And the Fringe Theatre Festival in Canada had a renaissance and took off. There was also the advent of social media platforms. Um, if you remember, early 2007, just about everybody before Facebook would have been on MySpace. And most um, theater companies in the region really didn't have any kind of a social media presence. I did, a large one. It was a, a social media forming community, if you will. So I had a voice, I had access to information, I appreciated artists, and I started writing. 
I never imagined in 2009 that by the time I retired, and I ran away, Amy, <laughs> I really did, um, that I would have produced um, an archive of material that extended to almost 900, well, over 900 articles on the arts in Victoria, of which 750 more or less are, on, are very theater specific, at a time that theater companies in Victoria went from 30 to over 70, where I was seeing 20 shows in a season, um, not a season season, like not a theatrical season, but a season of time. Um, fall, spring, summer. So where the output of people went from 20 shows in a three-month period to 60 shows in a three-month period. Um, and it was also, um, the Star announced just this week that they are no longer going to have dedicated arts coverage. So there's one person left standing in Canada today who is a dedicated arts critic, one. So that was happening too. And as an amateur who liked to write, I never imagined that my voice would become a critical voice, as in very important voice for the local um, performing arts ecosystem. And along with that, um, comes a lot of, well, a lot of restrictions. So we were asked to talk about the challenges in my own work of maintaining the records of performance history. So here I am, I've retired, I've moved to Campbell River, I'm no longer writing about the arts, and uh, I grew up at the time that the Provincial Archives moved into that building. It was some place that I spent my teen years uh, in the collections because I had a fascination for history before we could access it from our smartphones. And I'm, I'm sitting there going, I can't give up the URL. What am I going to do with 750 articles? So you're looking at 1,500 pages of work. Can I easily turn this into a book? Well, the answer is no, uh, it's not easy. And I had asked the question on Facebook, and lo and behold, from one person to the next, and Adrian Hollerhook at the Department of Theater Communications Department said, you should talk to Alana Lindgren. And Alana took what I thought was my writing about theater and went, well, Janice, it's actually an archive of this period of Victoria theater history. Um, I am the last, or was the last, written theatre critic standing in Victoria. Now they have moved to podcasts and to audio. So during the period of time that I wrote, I saw platforms disappear, Goodbye Posterous, Goodbye G+, um, I saw other ones come to the forefront. Um, we know that a lot of companies are behind the it was not the paywall, but the firewall of, of Facebook. And I didn't want that to happen either. So my archive, I've, I've continued to back it up while I'm looking for a place to deposit it. Um, but also realizing that there are probably no less than in Victoria alone five to ten people during that period of time who had significant work writing about theatre um, across Canada. I have friends who started um, stayed the Stage Door website back when the web was still in its early stages in the early uh, mid-1990s um, and thankfully somebody retrieved their website when it blew up. So how do we, as people who value the fact that you need to be collecting this material from a theatrical perspective, and I'm really interested to hear about the idea, and I forget who it was, was it Carolyn? It was Carolyn. Um, the, how do we get out to the young theater companies who might not have the energy to be maintaining a website? How do we get out to 
the theater bloggers that are across the country to convince them that this work needs to be in a repository somewhere. Um, right. So, and then I struggled with scalability. I did not want, because I had a particular lens that I saw performance through, which I think most people in Victoria would say was very um, complimentary or positive. I saw no reason to be spreading negativity into a climate that encourages people to be negative about the performing arts. Um, so I didn't want to give over any editorial control to other people to be writing on my own website. It's in my name and so with scalability how do you go from how do you see a hundred shows a year outside of the fringe where you see another 30 to 50 how do you write about that how do you write about it um, keeping it cogent and not just a puff piece how do you give insight into artists work um, and then funds you know, if you talk about $550 to maintain a box of records, you do need, you're, you're taking your own volunteer labor to do that work. Sure, you may get tickets in return or access to artists, but it costs you to host um, your website. It costs you money and the time that you're spending doing that and not something else. And I think, um, it's become really evident to me since I retired. My website has had about a million visitors since I put it online in 2011 and then about a million point seven reads. But the interesting thing to me is that I haven't written anything in over almost a year and a half and I'm still getting as many visits a month as I was getting when I was there actively writing and actively promoting it on social media and had links to the actual um, writing community because I was writing for Monday Magazine. Um, so not only was it, so recent searches led to articles written years ago, either about a place, Merlin's Sun Theatre is a local small theatre company in somebody's home, a performer, um, some of whom have gone on to produce work all across Canada, because of course we have visiting performers that come, or maybe about a show that had its inception here in Victoria and then has either been picked up by theatre companies around the world because it's a playwright um, or that has, um, has had some exposure because the company has taken it from here and toured it to Vancouver or elsewhere across North America. Or could even be about a, a show that isn't that new from an American musical theatre company that has been performed here. Why Next to Normal has struck a chord with people in Lyman Court's production, I'd love to know, right? Um, so, um, turning the online articles into a book at a time when I'm retired and quite frankly enjoying <laughs> being retired seems to be a task that's, that's far too daunting. Um, I would like the site itself to be ported to an academic online archive and it looks like that might be possible. And I'm really hoping that this explosion of creativity that happened in Victoria from let's say 2005 to the present time will be recognized for what it is in the larger ecosystem of the performing arts in Victoria because I think that we are the only major center where professional and semi-professional and emerging and student artists are very, very, very actively collaborating on projects and the boundaries are very, uh, in, in French, I don't even know what that word is, they're, they're very mixed, right? And you're going to get a chance to hear from Matthew who has been at the forefront of a lot of that explosion. So I'm really excited to hear what Matthew has to say. Thank you. Thank you. I request Matthew to take the stage and show us his work. No pressure. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Sarah, Karen, Emil, Matthew. SCAM is an acronym for the four founding members. Since 1995, it's been one big roller coaster ride. We make plays, shows, often outdoors in back alleys, on loading docks, in parks, in cars, occasionally in theaters too. We made it a part of our mandate at the outset to tour. Uh, here's Billy Nothing at the Toronto Fringe in 2003, and I thought the archivists might appreciate this <laughs> shot of an audience lined up in Honest Head Alley. Oh, How many sites where we've made theater are gone, have, or, or significantly altered? Have the memories we've made in the minds of our audiences archived the changing landscape and cities for them? We also run a festival called Stampede. We present companies from across Canada. This is Tara Began, who many of uh, you went and saw her show last night at the Belfry. She's a playwright as well as a performer. Uh, Stampede is a multidisciplinary festival featuring 10-minute works presented outdoors to an audience who travel by bicycle or foot from show to show. We hire a dozen students every summer to help us pull it off. And we like to think we attract a young, hip audience. <laughs> we like to decorate their own bikes and bring their families. Uh, and, and in a weird way, we've connected, well, not a weird way, we've connected more with families because as well as shows, touring, and a festival, we also took over operations of a local drama school a, a couple of years ago. So look out, we've got access to the next generation of theater makers. Oh yeah, and we have a pop-up theater. Uh, it's a 10-seat micro-performance space on the back of the truck. Uh, performers and audience go inside the theater to see short shows. So yes, SCAM has enough programs, thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, my role at the company is that of artistic and managing producer, and as my bio said, I've been a director, an actor, an administrator, production manager, stage manager, teaching artist, and writer. I have not published or archived my scripts, I guess, because I think they're not that great, or maybe I'll get around to, as Jim Hoffman uh, said of Energy Theatre, adjusting and updating the shows for, uh, for the current times. Uh, SCAM has dabbled in performances archive. Uh, uh, Caribou Buckaroo was a show we developed with the Honeywood First Nation in the Tsokotin region of BC. The show told the fictitious story of the first cowboy in BC, who intersects with the real story of the Tsoko War of 1864. I traveled to the territory, naively asked to speak with the chief, who was standing right behind me. I asked for permission to use the story of the war, and then I asked permission to appropriate the voice of a warrior chief in the play. Uh, I had to meet this chief as well as uh, the other chiefs. There are six nations in the Tsoko nation. Um, then we made the play in Victoria, and traveled back to Honeywoodine territory where we presented the first version of it to the entire membership at their monthly meeting. Uh, the play was two 40-minute acts with intermission. We were number three. Uh, we were the third item on the agenda between <laughs> number two, firewood, and number four, police presence at the upcoming rodeo. <laughs> we then stuck around for the rodeo so that um, people could offer their thoughts and feedback about the play and it subsequently made two or three tours of the Caribou Chilcotin, playing in rural halls throughout the BC interior. Uh, our current show, um, we've had some luck touring, that also archives, is called Fashion Machine. Five professional artists from the fields of textiles, theater, and photography work with 28 local children, teaching them aspects of sewing and performance, we chat about the fashion industry, how it's responsible for 10% of the carbon footprint, how it takes 2,700 liters of water to make a t-shirt, which is, much as a, is as much as a person drinks in two and a half years. Um, and then they do a public show where they remake select audience members' outfits in less than one hour. The show is over-archived. Uh, one of the professional scam artists is a photographer who takes uh, before pictures of the models with the team of kids that is about to cut up and alter the clothes the model has worn to the show. The models are so sad before their clothes are remade. <laughs> then during the show, the photographer takes candid shots of the kids at work, the audience, and still life. So we end up with this, at least 100 shots per show. This is Fashion Machine Austin, 
by Fuse, uh, presented by Fusebox Festival, April 11th, 2005. You can see how Fashion Machine ends there with a short fashion show, and how we've ended up with hundreds of shots of children from around the world as young artists have worked. Yes, they get paid a modest honorarium. So, to 2020. I had the idea to compile a book for our company's 25th anniversary, uh, which strikes me now as a form of archiving, now that I've infiltrated this conference. <laughs> um, our long-suffering graphic designer, Clint Hatzelak of Rayola Graphics, who's been pointed out, um, is here today. Um, he's probably furious with me for showing you this proof, um, which is entirely unfinished. Um, but he's done most of our posters, like almost every poster since 1995. So. Um, it, it makes sense for him to be working on the project. And as well as posters, the book is intended to contain photos and recollections from our audience on their first scam experience, because, tagline, you never forget your first. And as I consider preserving performance and, and the challenges that we were just talking about and consequences and so on, and because the book is going to be print on demand, I suppose over time we could expand and add to the volume with more detailed notes and stories on past productions, um, lists of artists we've worked with. Uh, it, the, the book can become a, a growing archive. Um, however, I, I get a little worried when I think about this because I, I worry that um, maybe we should do something a little more scam-ish, like maybe create an artistic director's commentary that accompanies the book and we'll call it a podcast or whatever the hip term is next year. Um, I mean, we're performance artists, right? And does anybody really need read anymore? I'm not sure. I suppose Scam is like many indie theater companies, an archivist's dream just waiting for an archivist. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matthew. So, like, um, so we have had four prolific speakers in front of us and their own works. So, before we move on to the question answer sessions uh, from our, like, before you open the session for our wonderful audience, so I would like to ask four of you if you have uh, anything for each other, any questions to ask. So, like, why do you find any reason any one of your presenters? Uh, like, so, you have a question? Sure. Yeah, yeah I was um, making notes as you guys spoke, and I, I think you're so right about the, the challenges of uh, money and um, ephemera, the, eph the ephemeral nature of our work, mm -hmm. and burnout. I think that's connected to retention of, like, Janice Lacoube, like we're not going to, Victoria can't replace those 900 articles that are going to get written in the next five years. We're not replacing critics, we're, they're all going, right? Um, and you know, there, something good will come of that, something will evolve from that. Yeah, something different will happen. Um, but I think, and I was struck by that comment, books are not easy. Oh my gosh, Clint, are they not easy? Like, <laughs> when did I say, we, like, I called you in August and said, we'll have this ready by the birthday party in January, and now we're still going, wait, this, like, now this is mammoth, right? It's, it's way bigger than we thought. Clint could speak to that. Um, I guess, you know, one thing I discovered as I went through these archives, prompted by getting ready for the company's 25th birthday party, uh, some of the guest speakers at the event were all, it happened that they were all in a show called The Right Lane, which was a sitcom that we did uh, for the theater. It was about um, kabuki cab drivers, so um, that's like pedicabs. Um, kabuki cab was, a, was the name of the, of the company in Victoria in the 90s. And um, it, the show was a cross between Friends and, um, and Taxi, except they were on kabuki cabs. So there was this whole environmental kind of bend to the work. Um, but one of the characters was named Haber, and um, we, and we were like, uh, how can I make this short? So the guy who played Haber was British, um, white, and uh, the character was clearly written as uh, like a bulky from, am I, I'm, well, it doesn't matter if I date myself, bulky from Perfect Stranger. So a character that comes from a kind of, anyway, from another place. The, the, it was not good cast. It was terrible casting. So. When we came to um, kind of introduce these actors, I was like, we can't really play any of the right, like, we can't play any of this show now. Yeah. I'm embarrassed by it. 
And now I, I kind of go, should this even be archived? Oh. Like, should we delete it? So are there things, my question is, are there things we shouldn't archive? Oh. <laughs> I want to talk to that because more, more than your show about the Kabuki cats was um, the Lewis and Dave show. Sure. So Lewis and Dave was a show that was too bit meant to be two fellows in the back seat of a cab arguing. Right? That's right. I didn't see the original. Yeah, I can't remember. But it's, um, it's a Norm Foster script written in '84. Yeah, and it was you redid it um, for one of it was a remix for one of your anniversaries. And it was very clear how dated that material yeah. had become in that period of time, right? So, yeah. I, I would argue that if, if we don't archive the negative parts of human history, how are we ever going to learn from them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then to that, I mean, maybe it's a question back to say if you're willing, willing to talk, like, not should we not archive, but how do we archive, right? So, yeah. Like, I, you know, the thought of getting current and ongoing consent from the people that were archiving seems really important and to ask. I, I guess what, um, you know, critics of the protocols have claimed that the protocols for Native American archival materials might distract archivists from their core work and mandate. But in fact, what we have found and what the people have found is that uh, it makes people better in all ways. So, you know, this question of how it might save them would be as I'm sort of getting the impetus from the protocols, and that's a really important thing. And, and so, uh, just yeah. to say that this question applies broadly in some in, in some respects, as much as like indigenous sovereignty is a unique thing, uh, it compels us to ask really important questions. Yeah, I agree. I think um, that it comes back to archival description as well. Um, and artists being involved in how their uh, collections and materials are remembered. And I think that that kind of reflect yeah. that, uh, uh, that that kind of reflection can be included in the way if you were a part of going through your own materials, if they were to be an archival um, donation, how does that reflection become a part of the archive? that you look back on your own work and ask these questions about what that work was and the moment that you made it and at what moment did you realize that there was something about it that um, did harm, which is why you're reflecting on not wanting to include it because you recognize that it may have done harm. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, there's self-determination in the archive, but also rethinking who does the archival describing and how that becomes a collaborative process um, so that you don't feel like you need to take it out because you can't speak to the fact that you know it's wrong. You speak to the fact that you know it's wrong, and, and then people can have a conversation from there. And those are the kinds of, Carolyn's referring to the fact that those are the questions that I'm asking in, in my own work. Yeah. I'd like to um, ask, because I realize that you were talking mainly about dance organizations, Carolyn, when you were looking at your survey, um, do you have a timeline right now that you're thinking about in getting the survey completed? And then how, once it's done, how are you going to publicize the fact that this exists and that organizations could come on board because other than, I don't know that there are any practicing, maybe one, practicing two, practicing theater artists here today, for instance, or anybody from the dance community. And it, it seems to me that that's an absolutely necessary part of the conversation that we have to have, or we're only talking amongst academics about work that isn't. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think my instinct is to say to try to go really slowly mm -hmm. um, and to be working 
somebody here in this room to answer that. Um, and also, in what I've learned in the last four years is, um, you know, to start by grappling with this question of indigenous, indigenous sovereignty. Because when I when I look at, you know, the survey that we've done in, in Vancouver and um, reckon, realizing that if, say, within the museums there were approximately uh, like 2,000 uh, dance-related items, mm -hmm. and that 75% of those are indigenous belongings, then the question sort of has to start there, mm -hmm. in my opinion. But, um, so yeah, to work slowly, to work as a team, and to be asking, to, to be asking the right people, like, many of whom are in this room, mm -hmm. and are not me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, let us open the session for the audience to have questions for our wonderful speakers. I can introduce an audience member with a good idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know what you're going to say. Well, just about, about the conversation we were having earlier uh, about the book and the potential for it to be a template. Yes. Oh, but it was kind of your idea, so I feel like you should talk about it. This, um, I think, is connected to, like, if Janice can be made to see her work as an archive, right. then maybe we, and I can be made to see this book as an archive, then, and if there's other companies that want a document. Yeah. Long suffering graphic designer, Clint talks a lot. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Clint, and I've, I've been working with um, Theater Stamp for, since 95. And I think uh, Dan Victoria is another my client since they started 25 years ago, approximately, and, uh, and Trevor Theater with the Fringe Festival and everything for since 94. So I have tens of thousands of files on my hard drive, all posters, programs, everything, which no one knows about. Um, they're all siloed. I, I've got everything backed up in triplicate. Um, and, uh, you know, it's all secure, but it's not connected to anything. Right. And the work I do for um, Ubit, you know, I've been working with them since 92, and they have no idea the, the resources that I have. I've got photographs of professors and, and, and events and things like that that are just sitting on my drive. If they contact me, I can get it to them in 30 seconds. But, um, it seems to me there would be value in yeah. having, like, speaking of the graphic designer, graphic designers are a key part because every theater company's poster program or dance program has gone through a graphic designer mm -hmm. at some point. There's a digital file for it. And if there was some system or knowledge that that stuff could be then sent to a central repository of something, I was, I was talking with uh, Jerry about uh, the Public Lending Rights Commission in Canada. For, there's one and a half staff positions, and they administer royalties for every Canadian book across the country. It's very lean. Um, something like that could be a resource model for theater companies, dance companies, or you know, that kind of thing where there's a life after that can be useful for academics as well as theater artists. I mean, It'd be nice to know who was the set decorator for some play that happened 24 years ago. Where has that person Gone. hopped to yeah. across the country? And unless you're scanning somebody's program notes, you really have lost that information that's already in the digital realm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what Matt and I were just talking about is alluding to because we're working on this book project, and I'm finding, even though I'm hyper-organized and I have all of their files, it's still a difficult process. But once we figure out a way of, uh, once we figure out a process for this, perhaps we could create this as a template that other arts organizations could use to collect and present their uh, archive material. Yeah, I would add that there's probably a broader audience for that than there is for a, a box of archival material. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Any more questions from the audience? Thank you. 
Um, thank you all very much for your presentation. Uh, so a lot of my thinking around gatherings has to do with locating audiences and spectators in the archive. Uh, and I really find myself thinking during your presentation about how I might find the audience in what you're talking about. Um, Amy, you were talking about the founders going to collect archival material. And does that make them a sort of spectator to the work? Does that inflect their archive process? Um, Matthew, I'm so curious about your relationship with your audiences as part of Theatre Scam. I would love to hear more about that, and especially this idea of uh, you never forget the first time you scam, if I heard that right. <laughs> uh, and, and the inclusion of, of the audience in this sort of archiving book. Uh, and then Janice, I also found myself thinking about the role of the, of the blogger, and uh, especially the positive inflection that you talk about. And I'm wondering if there's a connection there with the inclusion of audience members as a kind of complicating subjectivity to the possible notions of the objective archive. Is there sort of a, a tension there, or how might we better include those voices? Yeah, sorry, that's a lot to throw at you. So Jerry talked about his um, BC history archive and the work that he's been doing. And about the time that I started writing my blog, I became friends with a woman who retired to Victoria and unlike me running away from theater, immersed herself completely into theater and saw as much theater as I saw. And I'm on the edge of convincing her that all of those programs that she has collected over the years have a, a, a very important place in an archive somewhere. So I don't think that she's unusual. I don't even think that I'm that unusual when it comes to writing about theater. I mean, the great Canadian theater critic Lynn Slotkin started because she was a passionate amateur of theater, right? So, yeah, no, including the audience. So, theoretically speaking, in blog culture in the early 2000s, before we became obsessed more with social media, I think that the audience figured in that blog archive because there was a lot of commenting. Commenting happened on blogs, and then we got social media, and commenting then happened more on social media posts, right? And I haven't even thought about trying to archive those. Um, that's a really interesting idea of thinking of the archivist as audience. I hadn't really thought about that before, but it's it's very true because in the process of processing, you know, when 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 materials come in, you have to create a, a deed of gift form in order for um, the material, the ownership to be transferred from originator to the archive. And so you become quite intimate with the material in that process. And I, I was, um, one of the ones that I had, had done not too long ago was James Cadalca Cryer for James Cadalca's archives, which was at least 30, 40 years of material. Yeah, easily 40, because it was the stuff that his mother kept under the bed that they discovered after she passed away. And and so as I several times when I was going through that material, creating the inventory, arranging that kind of thing, and becoming very, very intimate with this person's life, I, I thought several times how strange it was to know so much about this person, and yet to him, I'm just the person who looks after the materials. Like he knows practically nothing about me. Um, and I have all this, like, you're, I'm reading correspondence and, you know, from major turning points in his life. And, but then also I think, so yeah, there's that side of it, but then I think also as that audience member of the archive, you also, in a way, become an advocate mm -hmm. in the sense that, like, so at Dance Collection DOS, because it's a very intimate organization, um, and we are subject specialists. When, when people come to us, I, I don't get people going onto the catalog on the internet and saying, I would like exception number, blah, blah, blah. I get people calling and saying, I'm, I'm studying modern dance in Alberta. What have you got? 
And so we have to be very intimately connected. And there's only two of us doing collections management work at, at DCD. So you become intimately connected to this body of material <coughs> and you become the database, which has its own dangers and challenges, uh, which I you know, have a long vision for, uh, 25 year time. Um, but um, but yeah, so you become the person that says, oh, you should look at such and such. Oh, and then that crosses with this, and you'll actually find some little pieces of this one over here, and you pull the stuff out, and you sort of become the advocate for these different pieces of material, putting them in front of the researcher to then interpret and um, you know do what they will. Um. Yeah, thanks. It prompts a few different thoughts. The archivist as audience is really interesting. I think to the archivist as story subject, like the, the project I alluded to, Caribou Buckaroo, the story of making that play is now way more interesting for me than the story itself. So yeah, yeah. Um, that kind of thing happens. And I think that story brings to mind, too, another point. I was thinking about challenges and money and um, grants and you know how do you fund this work, and I think I'm, I'm, I was on a jury with uh, jury stories um, with uh, so uh, and um, and, I, and, I, and it was professional development I think and I'm pretty sure we declined um, maybe it was your work uh, trying to, um, I feel like Julie Marcuse was mentioned in it so anyway I think I owe somebody at this table hundreds of dollars but um, we declined it because we couldn't you like it wasn't as interesting as the other projects at the table so so my gosh we've got to make this work interesting right like you've got yes. to, you know we got to figure out what the story is we got to figure out what story we're telling and why is it urgent why this story why right now right that's the thing we get told as artists like why this play why me right now why am i why do i want to act why do we want to make this work right now why is it urgent and so you know i mean we can see the urgency of archiving and like everything that's falling away from us right now, critics and records and uh, like it, it, you know, if we don't do it now, it's it's really urgent. And so I think there's a way to make it exciting and, and sexy. Yes. Yeah, okay, so I can add stories to that. So, so tell me about the time you declined. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, that fighting, that fight is, it's huge. It's a huge part of the, the everyday advocacy for what we do, the justification for our existence. It's constant. And we, so we are considered an arts organization. We're funded by, the, by Toronto, Ontario, and the Canada Council. And that's actually a better situation for us than being funded through Heritage, because the, the museum funding in Ontario is pretty pitiful. So we actually do better as an arts organization. And we, but consequently, we do a lot of artistic programming as, in addition to all the collections management work, which of course is what leads to the burnout thing. But, but on that note, in some places, in some, like for a long time when there were individual discipline offices at the Canada Council, in the dance office, there was something called support services to the dance milieu. And in one of the top lists of things that you could do in that category was art was archiving work, which was that was Ann Bell Wah who did that. And so we fit the category perfectly and you know, grants every time. Um, in Ontario, we are fighting with all of the creation-based organizations, and there it really is more of a fight because they're, they're, if the criteria is different from council to council, so they want to know how many bumps and seats, how many rural Ontario towns are you getting to with your programming? And, uh, and I once, and I, I won't mention the name, but was once told in a, we had a, had an all, like all arts councils meeting with DCD specifically at a crucial moment in our history, was told it was hard to advocate for a bunch of dusty old boxes versus creation. It's like, what is the point of investing in all the creation if there's no record of it ever happening? Yeah. So. <laughs> I don't know why I did that to you. I knew I needed to stop. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is more of a question. Um, it seems 
seems to me that my point in like transferring that question of how do we manage the archives to how do we manage information is perhaps not yet key to creation, but it seems key to management, right? Like if you're managing an arts organization, and I've like I've sat and I've like listened to people asking our um, volunteers to you know look for that contract that we wrote two months ago and can't find it. And, um, like volunteers are spending hours searching for stuff. Um, and also like you know where was that poster that we made five years ago or whatever? Like, the the necessity of um, taking good care of our digital records is very closely aligned to this question of archives. And if we can do both more efficiently, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. So maybe not sexy, but interesting. <laughs> more efficient. <laughs> Thank you. I had to double check the title of this session to make sure my question fits. <laughs> so the, the title is uh, Approaches to Archival Practice in the Performing Arts. And my research primarily has to do with young people and children. And so this question could be for all of you, perhaps, or maybe mostly the three people on this side of the table. But I'm really curious about how children and young people figure into your thinking about those approaches. And I'm asking the question in the broadest way possible, partly inspired by what Luann did during her presentation earlier today when she flashed us two images of children and explaining that this was part of why they were doing what they are doing. So. Yeah, so. Okay, so I'm thinking about children as audience, not children as in doesn't matter. Your choice. choice. Okay, so this is what I'm thinking. Of. Yes, I'm like, let's get them young, right? My babies grew up in the wrong, right? You know, going there regularly. But uh, I we created an education program that actually travels to and can go anywhere in Canada. Um, we used the Ontario curriculum as the base because we were funded by the Ontario Children Fund Foundation to create it, but it's cross-curricular, so it can really go anywhere. And there are these basically pelican cases that, that tour. Because I, I for, like, dance, for us, dance is not integrated into the education system as well as so many other things. And so we wanted to engage kids really early with the, so we go right from grades one to three with the primary kit, and it, it crosses curriculum with the mapping studies that they do. So we present to them, I think it's like half a dozen artists from different parts of Canada and practicing different genres. And then they see where in the world that artist came from and how they transported their art to Canada, if they aren't from Canada originally. And they learn a bit more about the art. And then they get to see artifacts that are part of our education our artifact collection. So there's some castanets and there's some tap shoes and, and things like that. Um, but I totally, totally believe history, kids can be engaged with history like right early on. You just have to have the right, but they love stories, right? Mm -hmm. Kids are a natural audience for stories and that's what we tell. All kinds of great dance stories, inspiring dance stories. Uh, yeah, thinking about children in our work, range of things. When, uh, when we started the project Fashion Machine, because we knew it was going to involve kids in the show, or we thought it would, we hit this point as creators where we had this great idea um, that was inspired by haircut art. We co-presented haircuts by children, and that kind of inspired it. Uh, not kind of, that did inspire it. And then we wanted a longer program. We wanted a more thoughtful process with the kids, and remaking an outfit provides that because it takes more time than learning how to cut hair, well, in crash course moments, anyway. And so we hit this place as creators where we couldn't go any further, because we knew it was going to involve talking about the fashion industry and all the thing, all the challenges there, one of which is where clothes come from and who makes them, right? So um, it wasn't until I did another project with the Intercultural Association in Victoria, and uh, th so that's an, a, a, an organization in Victoria that works with new-to-Canada families, 
And so we did a project, for, and the audience that came to this play was entirely different than any other audience I'd seen in Victoria. And I went, and, and it was full of families, and I went, oh, that, those, those are our partners for this project, if they're interested. And so we went to ICA and spoke to them about working with, um, with them on this project. We had this idea for a project, and, and, what, and how could we start? So it was a long, you know, it was a long iterative development process with workshops and working with them. And out of all that, and as we took on this operations of the drama school a couple of years ago, came policies that are very useful around working with children and criminal record checks and media releases for everybody that's um, that's in the shows. And um, and if there is a young person that can be photographed, keeping that in mind, and then how do you archive that safely, right? So. Um, and I think then that also connects with that, you know, as we move into youth and the early career artists and the, the dozen or so that we're blessed to work with every summer, um, just telling them about our experiences as a young theater company. In 1995, if somebody had said, okay, start writing it all down because, and make sure you keep it in boxes and make sure it gets up, <laughs> then, then I'd be okay. But, but it wasn't until, like, we didn't, we were just four people that did a, a, a night of short uh, shows in a cafe, and we did not think we were starting a theater company. We did give ourselves a name, but it wasn't until the show was sold out and the owner of the cafe said, this is awesome, let's do this next month. And we said, okay. And then um, Karen, Sarah, and I, Sarah and Karen had work elsewhere because they were better than I mean I. And, um, and so the company began to evolve right away. So the company is very much like a you know, who's in the room is the present company, right? And, and so that gets hard to track. That's like, I mean, we, we have lists of artists we've worked with, but they don't get updated often enough. Um, we have a document with the chronology of the, of, of the company, but I don't know if I have, it makes me wonder, connected to your question, whether we have, we, we probably have the first names of, of every kid we've worked with on Fashion Machine, because we make a slide um, that credits them, that it's part of the, sh that there's a, a big screen in the show that's um, broadcasting these images or this looping slideshow grows as the show was on. And then we also show videos of them introducing themselves to the audience. So I probably have documentation of all of them and I probably have first names, but it, so it makes me think about that aspect of children in our work. Some of them, some, <coughs> the safe parts archive, maybe, first names. And, <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Um, uh, uh, listening to Janice, I'm really reckoning with this idea that I'm now calling in my head the accidental archive, and really I, I, identifying, you know, early days of blogging and, uh, you know, the advent of social media following the collapse, the institutional uh, collapse or bereavement of uh, so many arts organizations, um, whether they're disseminating or producing. Anyway, this is all we do now. With Unconsciously, we're assembling archives through our communication and, and to waking up and realizing, oh, all of this activity actually is potentially an archive. Yeah. And everything is potentially an archive now in a way that's yeah. remarkable. And uh, you know, this is part of this AI turn, digital turn, information turn culturally. Um, and I just sort of wonder how, what that means, how we're going to deal with it. There's a lot of potential. There's also things that we are also losing, and I'll just add one thing, that I recently read this amazing book called A Queer Love Story, The Letters of Jane Rule and Rick Bebu. And these are letters, uh, Jane Rule was of course uh, uh, an amazing uh, writer, novelist, uh, early uh, lesbian advocate, uh, activist, and lived on Gabriel Island for years, and Rick Bebu lived in the the gay village and on Church Street, and they communicated over the body politic or, uh, organ, and uh, they turned into a, indeed a love story between letters, and which they 
continue to do for over two decades, share these letters. Um, anyway, this thick volume is only about 15 years of their letters, from around 1980 to 1995. But already within the letters, they start to address each other in these letters uh, about the fact that they're aware and their communities are aware that they are creating an archive yeah. of yeah. letters and start to negotiate yeah. with uh, publishers, editors, the Canadian Gay and Lesbian Archives, uh, and it doesn't stop them from producing, but it becomes enfolded in, into their work. And it's an amazing uh, book. But I also realized re reading it, because it was only published last year, that this is a vanishing species. This is probably one of the last new series of letters, <laughs> right, between highly engaged, literate yeah. people that was both a historical record, personal communication, and self-consciously, at a certain point, archival material. Anyway, I've talked enough, but um, I'm happy to hear from anybody on the panel about this idea of the accidental archive. Yeah. Um. Yeah, definitely. At, at, at some point, I'm sure that just about anybody who is an accidental archivist realizes, oh my good grief, I've been collecting newspapers for five years or bits of newspapers and this is now important, right? So yeah, I think that there are definitely a lot of, a lot of people out there like that. They, they are... It, there's a, a typing format that talks about the people that you attract to your organization and one of the types is definitely the archivist or the historian and you've got somebody else who's the promoter in the picture, you know, so it's how do we determine who those individuals are, what kinds of um, what kinds of ways can we engage with maybe even people in high school that would convince them in this rapidly changing, you know, I used to take about 10 rolls of film a year, 24 exposures, so 240 pictures a year. And when I was even younger and got my first camera, it was probably less than that because I lived in Ukulele, had to send the film away, it was extremely expensive. Um, then I got a Yashica, so it was mainly, and that's big format film, so it was usually just the contact sheets because you could never afford to print them. Um, and now, I take 240 pictures a day if I'm going somewhere. So what are the people of my, not my children's generation, they're in their 30s, but what's my grandson going to be considering to be an archive? You know, are they going to crumble under the weight of their lives that have been recorded to the nth degree from the time they were in utero? <laughs> And I actually worry about the opposite of that, and that is with my, the generation of my students, second year students. Yeah. They're, you know, they're, everything is did, done digitally for them. Yes. They they set up their cameras in the in the studio and they record whatever they're rehearsing that day. And I don't know how they're backing it up. I don't know they what do. they're doing, you know. And and also the Snapchat, right? My son is constantly on Snapchat. And it, it, it's ephemeral in nature. The whole point of it is that it, it disappears, right? And mm -hmm. So what I worry about is that we get to this 21st century, this early 21st century gap in the record yeah. where there's nothing. Because there's no, there are no clippings, because there's hardly any media coverage of the arts anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So we've lost that. If that generation of new artists is only using digital and not backing or not saving them in a high enough resolution that we can use them in a print publication one day. Mm -hmm. um, then I worry about that loss of record and also just the disassociation. So for example, the records from the 70s, somebody scribbled the names and the title of the piece and the choreographer and the costume designer on the back of the photograph, right? Mm -hmm. of, of, of the eight by 10 print. So there's this disassociation of information. If I've only got a digital image, from this person who was 20-something in 2020. Uh, 
20 years from now, I'm not gonna know who's in the photograph or what the piece is, or, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like we have to teach them now how, how to, and we actually do this at Dance with Action Plus. We have something called the Grassroots Archiving Workshop, which I've actually I've done it here. I've done it in a number of places around Canada. And uh, mostly the people who come are the dancers who are no longer dancing. And now they're thinking about their legacy. But it's like, I, I think I need to design one specifically for the youngest generation of, of new artists to say, okay, this is, there's gonna be no record of you unless you take these steps right now. Uh, and in support of Amy's future <laughs> um, workshops, I, I think that having access to like the information that is in existence that are out there, like there are solutions and strategies that are out there that uh, you know corporations are using or universities own um, that would be really beneficial to share <laughs> with nonprofits mm -hmm. in the arts and the um, uh, you know people have to learn how to use them, but also have access to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the physical stuff is way easier to keep track of than the electronic stuff. I know where the photos from 1998 are. They're in the box that says 1998. Yeah. But the photos from 2001 are in the lap. Where did I put my laptop? Yeah. You know, like I'm not sure quite. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it gets a little trickier to find. I also think there's an interesting connected to that is like the environmental impact of email. Like, you know, I think we thought at first there was none, but then <laughs> now we know. Uh, so just that impact of the electronic, the impact of all that electronic stuff. Mm -hmm. We've actually decided in our in our office now we're not going to thank each other anymore. Mm -hmm. We're going to assume that we all uh, <laughs> at, at the staff meeting weekly we'll thank each other for all the emails we've sent, and then that way we'll at least cut down on six oh. percent of emails in their office. Yeah. <laughs> but just to that to say, like I think that we need to think of ourselves not as accidental. So we've got, oh, the correspondence. I mean, I love it. It's such a great record of the past. And people, unless they print out their emails or back them up in some way, we're going to lose a ton of correspondence between collaborators, between, you know, it's, it's sad. And the other thing, too, and my kids will roll their eyes uh, when I mention this, but the fact that cursive is not taught in school yes. many years means yes. that some, at some point in human history, a huge chunk of our history is going to become like hieroglyphics. Yes. Because they're not going to be able to interpret the script. And that scares the heck out of me. And I, I'm sure their parent, my, their friend's parents aren't telling them that. I mean, my kids hear it all the time. <laughs> I want to add just one thing to that. And it, it's interesting that you talk about, because I'm not trained as an archivist, um, but I predate Windows, so learned how to organize things digitally because of a DOS-based system where you had the restrictions of file management and had to have some sort of an organizational tree, whereas nowadays you just search on your computer and whatever you've named it and wherever you've put it doesn't matter, right? So you're really dealing with the disconnect between younger users and people who understand the need for file management. Well, um, we are on time, like uh, <laughs> it's on the verge of closing the round table session. So at least we have uh, addressed all our challenges. <laughs> and prospects, right? So we are like there to break now. So if you have any questions, please ask our speakers you know, during that break. So please join me to, uh, to, a, to a round of applause to our great speakers. Thank you so much.